yeah um, i extend a very warm welcome uh, to all of you and uh, particularly dr chandan das gupta who's going to speak now and uh, living glass active matter at high densities now this is a lecture of uh, uh, sn bos medal which is a subject medal of the academy awarded once in 3 years since 1977 for outstanding contribution to the The award is made to an eminent scientist whose work has had an impact for a considerable length of time. I just would like to uh, read out some names that previous um, uh, award winners uh, from starting from 1977: E.C.G. Sudarshan, C.N. Rao, M.K.V. Bappu, A.N. Mitra, C.K. Majumdar, S.S. Jha, R. Rajaraman, G. Raj Shekharan, Deepak Dhar. Ashok Sen, D. P. Roy, Rohini Godbole, S. M. Roy, and J. Maharana. So I request uh, Professor Chandan Das Gupta to um, uh, to give his talk, and may I request all the listeners to keep their microphones off so that we can have a clear uh, hearing. Thank you. Okay, can everybody hear me? Uh, I can. I can hear you. And so, okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, good uh, evening, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, uh, first, uh, I'd like to begin uh, my talk by uh, thanking the Academy for uh, giving this award, and I'm uh, very happy and honored uh, to get this award. And also, I'd like to thank thank uh, Professor Shaha for asking me to give this talk. It's a uh, pleasure and a privilege for me to give a talk uh, to this audience. <clears throat> So let me go to full screen. <clears throat> so today I'd like to talk talk about something that we have been working on for the last five six years. Uh, that is uh, active matter at high density. Uh, <clears throat> before going into the actual subject, I would like to say one or two things about the area in which I work, because this award is given for some lifetime achievement. So I thought it would be useful to. Uh, tell uh, the audience a little bit about what kind of physics I'm interested in. Uh, I've been working in the area of statistical physics, where one is interested in uh, trying to understand the collective properties of uh, systems consisting of a large number of interacting objects. Uh, traditionally, these interacting objects are uh, microscopic, electrons and ions, atoms and molecules, things like that. Uh, but more recently, this kind of description uh, is being applied to study collections of uh, even macroscopic objects like you know sand particles granular particles and today's talk will be actually concerned with uh, living matter so people are now using this same kind of uh, <clears throat> framework to try to understand the properties of collections of bacteria birds and, and things like that uh, these objects are typically interacting so they affect each other's uh, uh, dynamics and uh, generally we'll be looking at uh, systems consisting of a large number of such, such objects uh, typically when I mean, we also do a lot of simulations on computers so typically we'll be looking at uh, let's say 10 to the 4th or I mean, in, 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 in macroscopic matter of course it's like 10 to the 23 so this is the general area of research and of late i have been trying to understand uh, some properties of dense active matter so i'll uh, just mention uh, begin with uh, introduction to uh, active matter, what I mean by that, and also since we'll be talking about glassy matter, so I have to give an introduction to glass transition and jamming. I realize that this is a, a mixed audience, so I will try to keep my talk at a non-technical level, and uh, I hope I'll be able to basically convey the uh, basic message of the kind of studies that uh, have been imported. <clears throat> Uh, second part of my talk will be motivation. Uh, uh, typically in physics, one is motivated by experiments. And here there are many experiments in biology as well as uh, experiments in soft matter physics that um, we would like to understand. Uh, <clears throat> the last part of my talk, of course, will be the work that I have been doing. Uh, we'll talk about some models, uh, analytic calculations. Uh, again, I'll keep uh, the technical details to a minimum, uh, simulations, and describe the results that I get from these calculations, and then eventually I conclude uh, <clears throat> with uh, what we have learned from these studies. So the introduction first is uh, introduction to active matter. Uh, <clears throat> active matter consists of a system where the basic constituting elements, uh, the particles, uh, <clears throat> are basically self-propelled in the sense that they can uh, move by themselves. 
they can convert stored or ambient energy into systematic motion. And uh, we'll be dealing with collections of such objects. And uh, these objects are, uh, appear in, in many different contexts. Uh, for example, uh, one can have motor proteins in cells which can move by themselves. The slightly higher scale, we have uh, bacteria. Uh, even on a macroscopic scale, we have uh, fish, uh, a collection of uh, fish or a uh, collection of uh, flock of birds. Uh, so what we are interested in is basically trying to understand the collective behavior of uh, such um, uh, systems. Uh, I should also mention that although most of the work is motivated by uh, living matter, uh, people are now uh, developing uh, methods to uh, construct in, in a lab uh, synthetic optic matter. Uh, and uh, I'll be talking about some experiments on those two uh, examples are genus colloids and vibrating rods and so on. Uh, the reason that people are interested in this kind of systems is, of course, uh, uh, the experiments show uh, <clears throat> very interesting collective behavior. Uh, and uh, I should emphasize at the beginning is that, is that you know, this collective behavior is out of equilibrium in the sense that uh, the systems have, the, the particles themselves have some source of energy. So one is basically injecting energy into the system, uh, which is uh, uh, then gets dissipated. Uh, so uh, one has to go out of equilibrium statistical mechanics to be able to understand the behavior of such collections of objects. <clears throat> Next few slides, I'll give you uh, some examples of such, such active matter. And as I said, many of them are taken from biology, but there are also systems that are synthetic in the sense that they have been constructed in the lab to uh, sort of mimic some of the biological systems that one is interested in. <clears throat> so here, there are some movies. Uh, I mentioned molecular motors, and uh, this is a simulation of a molecular motor called dynein and which is moving on uh, this, this uh, structure, uh, which is called a microtubule. And you can see, I mean, this, this is of course a cartoon, but uh, it, it shows basically the kind of motion, microscopic motion that is possible uh, that uh, this uh, self propelled particles, they uh, execute. So this is uh, <clears throat> one of the examples of uh, active uh, particles. Uh, <clears throat> I also mentioned bacteria. So there is uh, another movie where you have basically a, a experimental uh, observation of how different bacteria are moving uh, in a medium. And uh, this motion is peculiar in the sense that it is called run and tumble. Since that, you know, bacteria basically goes in one direction for some time and then suddenly changes its direction, goes in another direction for some time, then suddenly changes and so on. And this you can see from this trace that corresponds to the motion of one of these uh, uh, bacteria that, are, uh, that, that we are looking at here. And uh, here we have a dilute collection of bacteria, but I mean, what we'll be interested in later on is when you have a dense collection of bacteria, but the kind of motion of individual particles, individual uh, bacteria has this run and tumble property, which is illustrated here. <clears throat> Going on, uh, as I said, you know, one can look at uh, uh, <clears throat> dense system of bacteria. And uh, here is a movie again, an experimental movie of uh, how, uh, is a collection of E. coli bacteria move. And you can see that they are moving more or less at random, but there is some pattern in the motion in the sense that if I look at uh, the actual motion in more detail, we'll see that there are bunches of bacteria which are moving together. There are bunches which are moving together. And these are color colored here, shown here by different colors, uh, bacteria move, bunches moving in different directions. And uh, this is basically one example of a collective motion of uh, these living objects. And there are some features that I wanted to point out from here, this uh, swarming motion, which we'd like to model, for example, uh, when we want to understand what is going on. Another example is very common. Uh, this is uh, flocking of birds. And this is a um, uh, movie taken from YouTube. Uh, by the way, all the movies are showing all right, I hope. Hello? Yes, yes, yes they're yes, showing they're, very well. Yes, they're mm -hmm. fine, they're fine. Yeah. So you can see that you know you have a large number of birds and uh, they are flying, but they are not flying all independently. They their motions are very much correlated. They are just, uh, from these bunches and the whole bunch moves together and so on. This is called a flocking of birds, and this is one of the sort of many interesting collective behavior that people have been trying to understand. <clears throat> uh, another another example, just very quickly. Uh, this is called ant mill. You have, you see you have a, a whole bunch of ants. And again, you know, they're not moving at random. Their motions are very strongly correlated. They're all moving in the same direction. 
uh, along a roughly a circle. And you know, this is again an example of collective behavior. <clears throat> Uh, what I want to point out is that you know these are all living matters that I have shown before, but now people have been trying to sort of uh, emulate this kind of motion in lab also. And I wanted to show uh, a very nice experiment that was done by my colleagues at IASC, and there they are looking at uh, uh, tapered brass rods uh, in a background of aluminum beads, and this whole system is vibrated. That is what gives uh, this uh, self-propelled motion gives rise to this self-propelled motion, and you will see that uh, this uh, experiment is designed in such a way that uh, uh, the motion of different uh, rods they will eventually uh, correlate, and you will get something that looks very much like a flocking. So you see that initially they were distributed all over the place, but now they are all gone to the uh, to the edge of the system, and they are all moving in the same direction, very much in a way. Uh, that is uh, seen in this uh, previous uh, movie that I saw, or uh, that I that I that I showed of uh, flocking birds. So these are all sort of uh, examples, uh, both in living matter and on, uh, also in uh, artificial matter, artificial living matter of collective behavior. Uh, <clears throat> what we are interested in is looking at such systems in uh, the dense limit. and trying to understand what is known as glossy behavior or jamming in such systems. So I have to say a few things about what I mean by glossy behavior, at least again, you know, by being a general audience, one, uh, many of the people in the audience probably will, be not, will not be uh, that familiar with that. So uh, something, uh, just two or three uh, slides on glasses. Uh, a glass is something that you are, of course, very familiar with, uh, you know, uh, window glass or this, 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 uh, glass that I'm using uh, to drink water from. These are all examples of glass. Uh, there are many different kinds of glass, but uh, the uh, feature that is common to all of these uh, different kinds of glasses is that uh, here one is looking at uh, a solid, but the solid doesn't have the nice crystalline structure that you have in most, uh, you know, many other solids. So to prepare such a glass, one has to cool the liquid uh, very fast so that crystallization is avoided. And then one ends up at low temperatures uh, with, a, with, a, with a system, which basically has the mechanical properties of uh, a solid, but uh, it uh, doesn't have the long range crystalline order that you have in um, crystalline solids. <clears throat> so this is the process that one is looking at, starts with the liquid, and one, uh, this is the temperature and this is some property specific volume, doesn't matter. So when it's cooling this liquid and if it cools it, uh, if I cool it fast, then the crystalline crystallization transition that would have taken place at least temperature TM uh, is avoided. The system still remains liquid uh, at temperatures lower than this TM, and one gets a super cool liquid, and even at lower temperatures, one gets into a solid state, which I call a glass. The study of these glasses uh, have been there for uh, many, many years, I mean, uh, more than roughly uh, 80, 100 years, and there are many interesting phenomena that uh, take place in this uh, in this region, one is looking at the supercooled liquid as one is reducing the temperature. Uh, one of the most interesting things is that the viscosity of the liquid, which tells us about you know, the time scale associated with processes taking place in the liquid, that uh, time scale increases very rapidly as one goes to lower temperatures. Uh, this is, uh, <clears throat> well, this is just an illustration that one is looking at uh, disordered structure in a glass, not a crystal. Uh, the <clears throat> viscosity plot is here, uh, where one can one can see that this is a log logarithmic plot. So one can see that uh, the viscosity is increasing by you know, 14 or 16 orders of magnitude as the temperature is changing by let's say 50 degrees or 100 degrees. So this is one of the main problems uh, that people are interested in trying to understand. Why does the liquid become uh, so slow as it approaches the glass transition? One is also interested in the properties of the structure of the glass, the properties of the system in the glassy state, and so on and so forth. So this is a, this is, this is a very well-known problem in uh, condensed matter physics that people have been trying to understand for, for many, many years. And by the way, this uh, Nobel Prize uh, for Physics this year was awarded to Giorgio Parisi, and he has, uh, his work actually has a lot of relevance to trying to understand what is happening in such glassy materials. <clears throat> uh, I don't want to go into too many uh, equations, but uh, this is uh, one equation which is, which is very important, says that how the time scale or the viscosity of a glass forming liquid near the glass transition changes as a function of temperature. And without going into too many details, one can see that when the temperature equals this temperature that I have written down, the Vogel-Fulcher, uh, <clears throat> Uh, temperature, 
then uh, this uh, ex augmented exponent that goes to infinity. So this time scale itself goes to infinity. So basically what one is looking at is the situation the time scale is increasing very, very rapidly as one is going to lower and lower temperatures. And there are good experimental evidence that suggests that this time scale will actually diverge at a characteristic temperature. This of course depends, uh, this temperature depends uh, on which particular system you're looking at and so on and so forth. But this is the kind of phenomena that one is interested in that uh, uh, rapid growth in the viscosity or relaxation time as one is approaching this last transition from above. <clears throat> You will also hear some things about jamming in this talk. Uh, this is similar to the grass transition, but instead of lowering temperature, what one does is one increases the density. So let's say, I mean, this is something that all of you are familiar with. Let's say you have a collection of some hard objects in a two-dimensional box. And uh, in this situation, the, the particles can move around because there is space between the particles. But then as you compress the system, then one gets into a state which is called a jam state where the freedom of movement is lost. And uh, going from here to there is the jamming transition. And again, there are many interesting features that one observes in experiments near the transition and also in the jam state that one uh, gets at high densities. <clears throat> so these are things that have been studied a great deal in sort of conventional statistical mechanics, condensed matter physics, whatever you want to call it. But now, uh, as I said, in the last uh, 10, 15 years, there has been a great deal of interest in studying this kind of behavior in living systems where the individual particles, instead of being some sort of inert uh, objects like you know, dumbbells or uh, some uh, small spheres, uh, spheres and things like that, one is actually looking at uh, objects which can move by themselves. So why are we interested in this? <clears throat> Let's just skip this. Uh, <coughs> it's because uh, uh, again, experiments have shown that this glassy behavior or jamming has been observed in many experiments on dense active matter. And many of these experiments, as I said, come from biology and there are, there are some examples and I'll show you some experimental data that shows uh, this kind of the onset of this kind of behavior in uh, <coughs> dense active matters. And as I said, uh, people are also trying to now uh, construct in the lab artificial active matter and uh, lots of experiments on those. See, the, one of the issues is that, you know, in actual biological systems, uh, there are many things going on simultaneously. And so it is uh, difficult to extract, uh, you know, some, uh, some features and then trying to attribute that to some simple mechanisms because there are many other things that are going on simultaneously. So uh, doing these experiments in lab where one can actually sort of, uh, construct much simpler systems, uh, which can be modeled uh, more easily, which can be theoretically, uh, hopefully one, one can ex explain their behavior theoretically in a, in a, in a uh, easier manner. So both of these things are going on simultaneously. There are lots of experiments on biological um, uh, active matter, which show this kind of uh, transition from a fluid liquid like state to a glass like or to a jammed structure as uh, some parameters have changed. And uh, <clears throat> there are reasons to expect, uh, at least that's what this uh, authors of this paper tell us, that uh, this kind of a transition may play a very important role in, uh, in, in the function of that biological system. So uh, the next few uh, uh, transparencies, I'll try to illustrate or give you examples of such uh, phenomena that people have observed in biological systems. And I'll also give you one or two examples of uh, such artificial active matter. I have given you already one, you know, which is uh, the work of uh, Ajay Su, Sriram Ramasamy, and others. Vibrated granular material. <clears throat> I'll give you uh, one more example, which is the uh, genus colloids. So the next few uh, transparencies uh, slides will be on uh, examples of uh, uh, dense active matter and the kind of behavior that I've been talking about just now, uh, the transition to a a uh, glossy state or to a jam state as some parameters changed. So this was one of the first papers to draw our attention to this kind of phenomena. And here one is looking at uh, <clears throat> the cytoplasm, the liquid that is there, fluid that is there in, inside the cell of um, bacteria. And what they did was, among other things, I mean, the picture that I'm showing here basically tells you about this experiment. They put some tracer in this cytoplasm and they observed its motion and they tried to find out uh, what kind of motion is exhibited by this tracer, whether it is moving around in the cell or whether it's, it's stuck inside uh, some point in the cell. And they found uh, both kinds of motion. So here, an example of a tracer, which is sort of explored 
the whole cell, it is exploding most of the cell and, and so on and so forth. And this is basically the kind of motion they find when the cell is untreated, I mean, in, in its natural form. But then uh, they also did experiments where they added a chemical, which uh, did DNP, which basically turns off the active processes that are going on inside uh, the cytoplasm. And under those circumstances, they found that the tracer is basically stuck. It's not moving. So the difference between here and there is that uh, on the left-hand side, uh, this uh, bacterial cytoplasm is behaving like a liquid in which a tracer particle can move around. On the right-hand side, the <coughs> bacterial cytoplasm actually is looking like more like a glass uh, where uh, motion is basically frozen and uh, tracer particle, which, is, which I put in that glass, basically stays where it has been put and it doesn't move around. Uh, this is uh, sort of a quantitative uh, characterization of this behavior. This MSD is the mean square displacement. It's a measure of how far the tracer has moved in a certain amount of time. And as you can see here, the experiment shows that uh, in the untreated system, the, the, the normal system, uh, the tracer particle moves uh, as, as, as time increases. Eventually, this movement is saturated because the one is looking at a finite system. It cannot go very far. But as, as long as that the boundaries are not reached, it basically shows what is known as diffusive behavior. So this is the characteristic of a liquid. But in the DNP treated uh, sample, uh, the MSD is essentially zero. The uh, tracer particle doesn't move at all. So then people say that uh, one is basically going from uh, a liquid state to a glassy state. And uh, the uh, thing that is changing going from here to there is that the active processes that normally take place in the cell are being <clears throat> sort of frozen out by using this chemical. So or if I want to go from this side to that side, what one would talk about is basically fluidization, which is induced by activity. Here, the activity has been uh, suppressed and the system is like a glass or a solid. And then as you turn on activity, then it fluidizes and becomes a, a liquid. So <coughs> this is basically a biological system which exhibits behavior very similar to what one sees in the glass transition. <coughs> Uh, there are also uh, other biological systems, and here we're talking about a uh, uh, monolayer of, of cells. And here I have a movie uh, <coughs> which shows that initially the cells are moving around. This is what you would expect in a liquid like state. But as time progresses, the motion becomes slower and slower, and eventually the motion stops. So let's just play it one more time. Here the particles are moving uh, as in a liquid, and as time progresses, motion stops and it becomes uh, like a solid. And so again, you know, one is observing a transition from a liquid state to a, a jam state or to a glass-like state. There is no uh, crystalline order, of course, that you can see from here. So it, if it's a solid, it must be a glass or a jam state. And uh, this transition, uh, people have found out, is driven by increasing the cell-cell adhesion, the forces that keep two cells close together that increases and that basically makes the system go from a liquid-like state to a uh, <clears throat> glass-like state. There are now many experiments which sort of uh, uh, <clears throat> try to say that uh, this kind of a transition actually may have a very important, uh, uh, very important uh, role to play in various kinds of disease. For example, cancer, of course, you know, this is <clears throat> something that is very important. So something that has some bearing on cancer is uh, supposed to be very important. And uh, it's not uh, at this point clear whether what these people are saying is, 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 is uh, very important, but you know, these are experiments that show that uh, there's something going on in the systems which may have very uh, relevant, may have a strong relevance to uh, the, the progress of the disease and things like that. So what one is doing here? One is looking at, uh, <coughs> again, cells, and uh, you have this MCF10A, uh, these are uh, healthy cells. And then the, the next panel, you have this MDA, MB, et cetera, et cetera. These are <coughs> cancer cells. So what they're doing is they're basically uh, monitoring the motion of these cells over a certain period of time, uh, two hours, four hours, six hours, and so on. The <coughs> healthy cells, they don't seem to move very much. Whereas the cancer cells, they move much more in comparison with the healthy cells. And uh, as you can see here, uh, this is crosses and the, and, the, and the different colors tell you about the positions at different times. And these positions are very similar uh, even after six hours in the healthy cell line 
but these positions have changed quite a lot in the uh, <coughs> cancer cell line. And again, this is quantified in terms of uh, quantity, which is called the displacement, which is how much a particle has moved. And if you plot uh, this as a function of time, then this uh, green uh, curves correspond to healthy cells and uh, the blue curves correspond to the cancerous cells. And as you can see here, the healthy cells don't move very much, cancerous cells move a lot. And uh, again, this is something that is similar to a glassy state here for uh, <clears throat> the healthy cells and uh, uh, fluid state for uh, the uh, cancerous cells. And people are speculating that this may play an important role in the metastasis where the cancerous cells move from one tumor to other parts of the body. <clears throat> there has been some, again, very recently, uh, some discussion of the role of this kind of a transition in asthma. And again, uh, <laughs> I'm showing experimental results. So uh, they are looking at, uh, again, two kinds of cells, uh, asthma cells that are involved in asthma, and those are non-asthmatic. And they are, again, looking at uh, how much they move. And uh, this color basically represents how much they move. The red color corresponds to motion by large amount, and the blue color corresponds to motion, which is almost not there. And again, you know, one is looking at uh, the behavior of the cell, uh, cell collection uh, over a period of time. And uh, there is a, even if you look at you know, each individual cell line, uh, <clears throat> there is a transition from uh, a unjammed fluid-like state into a jammed solid-like state. In the sense that, you know, as you are going from day three to day six, the cells which are moving quite a lot in day three, they don't move at all on day six. Same thing here, that uh, the number of cells which are moving quite a lot uh, in day, day six, they don't move so much on day nine. And the difference between these two is that this transition occurs much later in asthmatic cells, in the sense that this transition is occurring beyond day 10, whereas here from the non-asthma cell, this transition is occurring uh, within day six. So there is some difference in the, in the, in the, in the, in the motion or collective motion of the cells, depending on whether one, one is looking at uh, cells which are involved in uh, asthma or healthy cells. So again, you know, uh, this, I uh, just want to point out that this kind of uh, transition from a fluid-like state where the cells are moving around more or less like the molecules uh, move around in the liquid to a state where the cells are basically jammed or uh, stuck into a glassy or jammed state uh, is, is very common. And uh, there are reasons to believe that uh, this transition may play an important role in various disease and other things, other properties of living matter. So these are all living matter. I just wanted to show another recent example uh, of uh, synthetic aptic matter. It's called uh, genus colloids, a colloid which is uh, colloidal particles which are coated with different kinds of metals on both sides, and then they put in hydrogen peroxide, uh, which interacts with the metal on one side. As a result, uh, the, the colloids can sort of move by themselves. And uh, the amount of activity is, of course, controlled by the amount of hydrogen peroxide. When there is no hydrogen peroxide, there is no activity. So now again, one is looking at uh, motion of these colloidal particles. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, here, uh, this is a measure of how much they move over a certain period of time. And one is uh, plotting that as a function of uh, hydrogen peroxide. So as you make the particles more and more active by adding more and more hydrogen peroxide, the particles move much faster uh, to, to much uh, larger distances. This is shown here, that it's a uh, uh, mean square displacement as a function of time. And uh, if you have a high concentration, then uh, you, you see diffusive behavior. Whereas at lower concentrations, the particles get stuck. So again, one is looking for looking at a transition from a stuck or glassy or jammed state to a uh, liquid-like state, moving state, as one increases the amount of activity that you are uh, <coughs> giving to these particles. So let's see, I'm more or less halfway through. So this is, <coughs> I wanted to spend a lot of time on this because this is something that is accessible to even non-experts. And so basically what uh, the summary is that you know, there are now many experiments in biology as well as in other condensed matter, in soft matter systems uh, where one gives activity to the constituting objects. And uh, as a function of activity, these systems undergo a transition from uh, a jammed or class-like state, which is there if there is no activity, to a state uh, where the activity makes these particles uh, behave like, like a liquid. So there is a uh, <clears throat> jam to liquid transition or glass to liquid transition as a function of increasing activity. And this is very common as I've tried to show in uh, biological systems. Uh, also, one can sort of reproduce that in, in labs. 
and uh, what uh, my uh, work has been over the last five six years is to try to understand this behavior and uh, characterize this behavior and uh, basically develop a theoretical framework in which uh, one can sort of figure out what is going on in these systems. <clears throat> so these are the questions that uh, we have been asking. Uh, can activity fluidize a, a glassy system? Uh, many examples of that I have shown in the experiments that I just discussed. Uh, then of course one can play around with the strength of the activity uh, and other parameters like temperature and density and then one is interested in kind of a phase diagram, uh, which shows uh, uh, some region where the behavior is uh, glassy or uh, stuck, and some regions where system behaves like a liquid. So what is that? Uh, what is the, the phase boundary basically sort of demarcates between these two kinds of behavior? And one would like to understand uh, that phase boundary theoretically. Uh, <clears throat> there can be structural changes uh, induced by activity. Uh, the way the, the dynamics looks like as one approaches the glass transition may also be affected by this activity. And uh, the <clears throat> glassy state itself may depend on whether you are looking at a normal glass or an active glass. So these are many of the questions that many people in the field they have been trying to understand. And uh, the remaining 15, 20 minutes, I'll try to give you uh, <clears throat> a flavor of the kind of work that we have been doing on this subject to understand some of these questions. <clears throat> So here, I mean, as, as is usual in, in physics, we don't really uh, want to, at least at the beginning, deal with all the complications that are there in a biological system or even in a synthetic active matter system. So we deal with idealized models. And the ideal mo idealized models consist of a set of particles. And uh, here I have drawn the particles with different colors because in glass transition, typically one looks at mixtures so that you know, crystallization can be avoided. Uh, so typically one looks at uh, particles, two types of particles or many types of uh, collection of many types of particles where the forces, the sizes, et cetera, differ as one goes from one species to another. So here we are looking at a two uh, component system. Uh, and this kind of systems have been studied uh, you know, to a great extent in uh, standard glass transition literature. Here we are uh, adding this arrows and the arrows are the directions of this self-propelled forces or active forces which are acting on these particles. So uh, in typically, I mean, you know, uh, one looks at typical active matter, the direction of this force that acts on a particular particle doesn't remain constant. It itself changes. And so we use two parameters to characterize this activity. One is the strength of this active force. That is of course important. The other is how quickly this active force changes its direction. And that is uh, that that quantity is, is of course a measure of time, uh, the time over which the direction changes by a substantial amount, and uh, that uh, quantity is called the persistence time. So we'll be looking at such systems. Uh, such systems are characterized by you know what kind of particles you have, how they interact with each other, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Density, temperature, these are the other parameters. In addition, we'll endow these particles with this active force, and active force will be characterized in terms of the typical magnitude of these forces and uh, how this direction of the active force keeps on changing as a function of time. <clears throat> so we have, <clears throat> over the last five, six years, we have studied many systems, uh, not many, but several systems of uh, such kind. And I will uh, give you a sort of a quick review of the kind of results that one gets from these studies. <clears throat> so our work started with uh, this model, which is called the uh, Cope Anderson model which is a very well-known model in the study of uh, passive classes. And uh, then we uh, introduce uh, activity in the systems and then try to understand how activity changes the behavior of such systems. <clears throat> a few things about this, uh, again, you, uh, you don't really need to worry too much about this, but it's a, a binary mixture because I want a good glass former uh, to, uh, to study. And uh, so it can be maintained in the supercooled liquid state for a long period of time. And uh, then we <clears throat> say that uh, this red particles, B type particles, uh, they have this active force. And this active force is characterized by its magnitude. And then also the time scale over which the direction of the active force changes. And in the first uh, uh, set of studies, we <clears throat> consider systems where this uh, persistence time is short. Short, uh, short compared to the relaxation time that you have in the glossy liquid. So 
few, uh, and this, this is a paper that came out in 2016, few examples of the kind of uh, behavior that you see. Uh, just uh, look at this, this picture, where we are looking at the diffusion constant. The diffusion constant is a measure of uh, how fast a particle, uh, in some sense, diffuses in a liquid. The liquid, the particle will have a non-zero diffusion constant. In a solid, the particle doesn't uh, move around so much. So the diffusion constant will be zero. And uh, so here we are looking at the diffusion constant as a function of temperature. High temperature uh, and these different curves correspond to different active forces. The one at the bottom corresponds to zero active force. And uh, as, as we go like that, the active force increases. <clears throat> so you, you can see here that uh, at the, at the system that we're looking at, the diffusion constant drops uh, very, very rapidly with decreasing temperature when there is no activity. So this is logarithmic scale. So this, this corresponds to, as you can see here, three or four orders of magnitude of a uh, drop of the diffusion constant. So this is the usual glass transition behavior, starting with a liquid. And as you are going to lower temperatures, it's approaching the glass transition. And it is approaching a solid in the sense that the diffusion constant is becoming very, very slow. But this, uh, <laughs> is modified as one grows to uh, active systems. As one goes to active systems uh, with force uh, 1.5 in some reduced units, then one can see that the dynamics has become faster. Similarly, if you keep on increasing the activity, the dynamics becomes faster and faster. So the glass transition that one sees here in the passive system eventually uh, gets completely eliminated when the system is made sufficiently active. So this is an activity in this fluidization that I have been talking about when we're discussing the experiments. So basically, this is uh, the conclusion that the glass transition temperature obtained from, uh, we fit the relaxation time or the viscosity to this form that I had told you about, and that gives you a glass transition temperature. So one can get the glass transition temperature as a function of activity by looking at curves like that. <clears throat> so the glass transition temperature uh, decreases as uh, one makes the system uh, more and more active. <clears throat> and uh, Uh, eventually, the, uh, there is no glass transition at all in the sense that uh, for all uh, temperatures over which we can study the system, it behaves like a liquid if the, if the particles are sufficiently active. So this is shown here in the phase diagram that there is a temperature here along this axis and there is an active force along this axis. So when there is no active force, uh, the glass transition temperature takes place at some, some value. As one uh, turns on the active force, the glass transition temperature decreases and eventually goes to zero such that if the activity, active force is a strength, which is above this value, then the system is always in a liquid and uh, you cannot uh, sort of uh, make it into a jam, get it into a jammed or a glassy state, even by reducing temperatures to very, very small values. So this, these results were obtained from numerical simulations. But then we also did some kind of a theory uh, where one uh, looks at uh, how this uh, glass transition temperature should depend on the active force. And uh, these um, uh, symbols that we have here represent the results, the, the predictions of this theory. And this sort of shows that we can more or less understand why the glass transition temperature is being reduced when we increase the active force. <clears throat> and these are experiments uh, from uh, for this genus colloids. And just wanted to point out without going into details, the shape of this phase boundary that we get and the shape of the phase boundary that they get, they are quite similar. So one has in some sense some understanding of what is going on in these experiments. <clears throat> on the theoretical front, uh, we uh, improved our theory and then uh, we, and this is again too technical for me to get into, but uh, there is a class of theories known as random first order transition theory uh, <clears throat> that uh, people developed uh, in the context of uh, the usual glass transition temperature. We can generalize that to active systems. And uh, <clears throat> then uh, just we have a prediction of how the relaxation time depends on activity. This, this parameter is activity parameter strength, and this tau p is uh, uh, persistence time. So basically, this is a theoretical prediction. And these are results of simulations. And we can see that uh, our predictions uh, agree reasonably well with uh, what we see in simulations. There's a paper that was published later in uh, PNX. <clears throat> 
Continuing with this theme, uh, we again uh, look at uh, the second sort of system that we looked at was similar to the first uh, kind of systems, but instead of having the spherical particles, we have dumbbells because these bacteria typically are like cylinders and so on. So we looked at how rod-like objects, uh, which are active, uh, if we have make them dense, then what kind of behavior one gets in those systems. And we get behavior which is sort of similar to what we just described in the, in the, in the system of spherical symmetric particles, but there is, uh, one uh, thing that I would like to point out, which again sort of compares what we see in our simulations with uh, what is seen in biological systems. So this is uh, results of our simulation, which tells you about how this how these rods are moving around. And you can see that uh, they don't move around by themselves. They form these bunches and uh, the, all the rods in a particular bunch, they all move in the same direction. Again, to see it from the beginning. And one can, quanti one can quantify this. I mean, one can quantify the sizes of these bunches and things like that, which we did. Uh, just here, I want to point out that this motion is essentially uh, very similar to what one is seeing in this uh, experiments on a collection of bacteria, where the bacteria are also moving in bunches, but you know, they don't move all in the same direction. Uh, they continue to change their directions, but uh, there is a correlation between the velocities that uh, bacteria sees here, or a particle sees here, and its neighbors. And this is not put in by hand. This is something that emerges from the dynamics of the system. <clears throat> so the last thing that I wanted to uh, spend uh, maybe five minutes on <coughs> is, uh, is uh, this is something that we have done uh, very recently, just a, uh, a couple of years ago. And we are continuing to study this system in more detail. So here we are looking at what is known as uh, extreme active matter. So in the previous two examples, uh, the activity was not very strong and the uh, persistence time was short. But now we are looking at systems where the activity can be large compared to other forces. The active force can be large compared to other forces in the system. And uh, we have a long persistence time. And uh, the model that uh, we look at is in the next uh, slide. Again, a, a two component mixture, et cetera, et cetera. The, the difference with previous uh, work is that we are looking at thermal dynamics, looking at a limit where thermal fluctuations are not important. So we are just looking at interparticle forces and the active forces, just to make things a little simpler. And uh, you know, uh, many of the biological systems, if you look at cells and things like that, thermal fluctuations are typically not so much important. So it's, it's, it's not so uh, very far away from uh, the actual systems. This is a thermal limit. And uh, <clears throat> I didn't show any uh, equations, but this is uh, the only equation that I want to show that this tells you about how the uh, position of a particle changes as a function of time. Uh, inter <coughs> x is the, x, x is the uh, vector that uh, quantifies the position. So double dot means second derivative. This is the acceleration. This is the velocity. These are the forces that a particle sees from all the other, fo other forces. And this is the active force magnitude f and its direction n, and this n uh, itself changes as a you know, function of time, and the time scale associated with the change of n is given by this parameter tau p, which is the persistence time. So this is the model. And we are looking at values of persistence time, which can be quite long compared to the, uh, some of the other time scales that you have in the uh, passive liquid. So I just wanted to point out that in this limit, uh, new physics come into the picture. <coughs> In particular, there is one limit that we are looking at in detail, uh, which is infinite persistence time, in which the directions of the active forces, they remain fixed in time. They don't change as a function of time. Different particles see active forces in different directions. The magnitudes of all, all these forces are the same, but uh, the directions uh, uh, are chosen uh, randomly. And once the directions are chosen, uh, that doesn't change um, uh, in subsequent time. And what we are looking at is looking at the behavior as a function of this active force. So here you have a large active force. And what I'm plotting here is the kinetic energy, which is a measure of, uh, let's say, how fast the particles are moving. Now, in a liquid state, uh, of course, the kinetic energy will be finite. The particles will move, uh, so they will have some finite kinetic energy. And as they collide and uh, interact with each other, uh, kinetic energy will change, and they will exhibit this kind of a fluctuating behavior as a function of time. So this is what we see for large F. Now, remember that in this case, there is no thermal fluctuation. So here is a liquid 
where uh, the system is liquid because it is experiencing, the particles are experiencing large active force. So in the phase diagram, you are looking at, uh, this is the active force and this is the persistence time. One is looking at uh, the limit when the persistence time has gone to infinity. And so the thing that we are looking at here is large values of the persistence time where the system is in a liquid state. <clears throat> we reduce the active force, uh, it's still in liquid state. But if we reduce it below a certain critical value, then you see that all motion stops. So this is what is known as the jamming transition. That uh, this is a thermal, so uh, the jamming is a better description than uh, the glass transition. So high temp, uh, so high uh, active force. One is in a liquid state, unjammed state, and then as one is reducing the active force, then uh, there is a characteristic value of the force at which the system jams and becomes uh, solid. So this is. Uh, uh, jamming transition induced by active force, and uh, this is uh, one of the one of the sort of interesting things that we see in the system in the limit of infinite persistence time. And at, 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 uh, at the present time, we are actually trying to characterize this transition, trying to understand the properties of this uh, active jam state and and things like that. So that's one line uh, for that is going on. Mm, let me skip this because I'm spending the time. <coughs> Uh, now, uh, I'm looking at a situation where uh, the uh, persistence time is not infinity. So the force uh, acting on the active force acting on a particle changes its direction, but it changes its direction very, very slow. So one is now uh, in this phase diagram in a situation where uh, this tau p is, let's say, 10 to the fourth, where one is looking at this, and then one is changing the active force to find out how the behavior changes. Again, you know, there is a transition fr from a liquid to a glass or to a jammed state, dynamically arrested state, as you reduce the uh, F that we have seen earlier also. In the other systems that we talked about, there is a uh, activity induced fluidization. So low activity, the system can be in an arrested state and then it becomes a fluid as one increases activity. But in the earlier studies, the liquid state was uh, not all that interesting. But in this large persistent, large tau p limit, we find that this liquid state exhibits uh, very interesting behavior which I call intermittent behavior. What do I mean by that? Uh, so let's say if I'm looking at F equals three, which is up in this red region, where it's an ordinary liquid, and if looking at the time series of this kinetic energy, it shows these usual fluctuations that we had seen earlier. That's typical of a liquid. But then as one reduces the value of F, one is uh, entering this region, uh, sort of, which is indicated by uh, green here, where uh, as a function of time, there are time intervals where the system behaves like a liquid with this kind of uh, behavior of the kinetic energy, but then it freezes. It goes into basically a state where the kinetic energy is essentially zero, it goes into a stuck state. And then it comes out of the stuck, the stuck state and then exhibits again liquid-like behavior for a while, and then again goes into a stuck state. This is what we call intermittent. So there is long periods of jamming separated by, uh, <clears throat> long periods of jamming basically means that, you know, this kinetic energy is essentially zero here, zero here, etc. If I go to smaller values of F, the time interval over which the kinetic energy remains zero, so the system remains jammed, that increases and so on and so forth. And eventually below a certain value of F, uh, we don't see this, uh, this spikes at all. The system has basically gone into a dynamically arrested state. So one is going from a liquid to uh, this sort of interesting liquid, inter intermittent liquid, uh, to a dynamical arrested state as one is decreasing the value of F for a large but uh, finite value of tau p. When tau p is small, what we are uh, talking about earlier in the first few models that we looked at, one goes from the liquid to the glass in one state. One doesn't see this intermediate state, but here for large values of tau p, one is seeing this uh, intermittent phase, which uh, shows up in many other areas of uh, driven matter. So the intermittent state is very interesting from our pers perspective, and uh, we'd like to understand many things about the intermediate state. Uh, for example, I mean, uh, the distribution of the intervals over which the system remains jammed, uh, the, the nature of the events, this plastic yielding events, which take the system from a jammed state to a liquid state, et cetera, et cetera. So many, many properties of this are being inter uh, investigated at this point. Experimentally, the intermittency uh, is being seen in some experiments, but it hasn't been characterized very well. But you know, that's one thing that we're looking forward to, that if one can prepare a system in this intermittent region, then a lot of interesting things can be seen. <clears throat> so let's just uh, show you one more uh, picture, and this is the intermittent state. 
So <clears throat> these are the particles that are there in my system. Uh, the, there are green, uh, blue particles and red particles, which are basically two different kinds of particles. And uh, there are these arrows, which tell you about the fact that uh, they are experiencing this uh, active force. And uh, if we look at the motion of the system, then we'll see something which is interesting. That here, the particles are moving around. But now, the particles have gone into a state which uh, there is hardly any motion. System stays in this state for a while. And then again, uh, there is some plastic events and the system again begins to move. This is what we call intermittent behavior. Uh, <clears throat> again, you know, this is uh, something that you may want to see again. Here, the, uh, the particles are moving, then it's gone into a jam state where there is hardly any motion. And uh, from that again, uh, there is some uh, <clears throat> unjamming events, some uh, plastic events, which takes it into a liquid state. And this keeps on going as I mean, this is just a small segment of the time history. But if I plot the uh, look at the behavior over a much longer period of time, there will be this periods of move period of uh, jammed behavior, and then intermediate uh, between two such jammed behavior, there will be liquid like behavior. And uh, one can study various things about the distribution of time scales associated with uh, liquid like state and uh, the jammed state, uh, etc. How, how that depends on the various parameters and things like that. This is what uh, something that we are uh, studying in great detail now. So I think my time has more or less come to an end. Uh, one more thing that I didn't have time to mention is that uh, in this phase diagram, there is also some region, which is, I, I don't know whether you can see it, it's called plastic turbulence. The behavior dynamics that we see in this region is very similar to what one observes in uh, ordinary fluid turbulence. So that physics of that also is contained to some extent in this system. So this is uh, where I end, uh, just a, a brief summary of what I have tried to convey to you, that we are looking at dense active matter, uh, sort of new class of non-equilibrium systems. Uh, and we're looking at uh, the behavior of such systems near the jamming or the glass transition. And uh, we see many uh, interesting uh, phenomena. Uh, glassy behavior is there, jamming is there, uh, yielding or plasticity uh, is also seen here. Uh, in some region of the, uh, of the parameter space, we see turbulence. And so this is a, a condensed matter system, uh, which brings together the physics of many such phenomena, which are of interest to many condensed matter physicists, soft matter physicists, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a driven classical system. Uh, as I tried to tell you at the beginning, the Interest in this kind of systems uh, arose mostly from uh, biological experiments. And uh, we are beginning to make contact with these experiments uh, in the sense that you know, there are a few things that I showed, which uh, sort of try to illustrate that uh, qualitative behavior that we see in these simple models mimic some of the things that one observes in these biological systems. Uh, but of course, I mean, you know, to make uh, uh, Sort of better contact to make actual predictions that can be tested in biological experiments and so on, one would have to put in uh, some of the details of the biological systems, which makes the system much uh, more complex and uh, more difficult to deal with theoretically. But that is uh, one of the directions in which uh, research in this area is going. Uh, we are uh, doing some of work along, along those directions, but uh, at this point, most of our efforts are uh, concentrated in trying to understand the kind of behavior that I sort of illustrated in the in the studies that we have made of uh, simpler systems, and if one can understand that, then perhaps you know one can put in some biological details and then try to make a better uh, comparison with uh, the experiments that are going on in uh, several biological systems. So that's basically where I end. Uh, with uh, well, I must uh, acknowledge the people that I have been working with to you uh, know this work there are the three or four, uh, four or five papers that are, have, been, have come out which basically talk about the material that i uh, discussed in the second half of my lecture uh, ex student rituparno ex student pranob pinaki was also an ex student but now uh, I mean, he started this work when he already was a faculty member mazan rao many of you know uh, uh, an ex student 30 years ago uh, he's working at ncbs Saroj, another ex-student who is now working at uh, <coughs> TCIS Hyderabad, and then some people in Weizmann Institute and some people at Brandeis um, University who have uh, contributed to the work that I have been talking about 
in this in this uh, <coughs> presentation. So that's where I basically is the end of my talk. Uh, thanks a lot again for your attention. And again, I'm grateful to the Academy for the opportunity to present this material to this uh, to this audience. Thank you. And who would, would be happy to take questions? So you can stop sharing. To yeah, swing stop here. So, Professor Dasgupta, how how do you do the simulations if you know the you're saying that the time scales may change by 10 raised to the minus 16 and so forth? Mm. So, how how are you able to really sample such sorts of long time scales? Uh, no, in, in simulations, there we, some we, sort of special techniques. No, not really. I mean, we cannot go beyond. <laughs> Uh, I mean, we cannot reach those kind of time scales that uh, you see in actual experiments. Uh, there are now some uh, simulation techniques that allow you to equilibrate the system to uh, temperatures where the actual time scale can be uh, very, very long. But one cannot uh, one cannot uh, simulate the dynamics. So these are special sort of Monte Carlo kind of methods where one can use to equilibrate the system at uh, low temperatures. But uh, to just the, to look at the dynamics at low temperatures, there is still uh, a very big gap between the time scale that one can access in simulations and what uh, one sees in experiments. Uh, Mr. Kakar, if there are no more questions, shall I go ahead with reading the citation for the medal? Yes, I, I think that you can read the citation. Unless there are more questions, I'm not sure. Okay, perhaps I'll go ahead then. So, it is my pleasure to read out this citation for the Satyendranath Bose Medal in Physics for the year 2018 that is being awarded to Professor Chandan Das Gupta for his outstanding contributions in theoretical condensed matter physics with emphasis on statistical mechanics. His work elucidated the role of topological defects in various phase transitions and has found applications in a wide variety of problems, including development of a theoretical understanding of the effects of quench disorder in condensed matter systems. Professor Dasgupta has made important contributions in the theory of structural glass transition where he pioneered the use of density function, functional theory, finite size scaling methods, and replicated liquid state theory for studying glass transition. Professor Dasgupta has also played a major role in establishing the Center for Condensed Matter Theory at the Indian Institute of Science in 1998 and was the convener of the center till 2005. He helped start the undergraduate program for IISC in 2011 and served as the dean of this program for the first four years. Professor Dasgupta is an honorary professor at the Department of Physics, IISC, and since 2017, he has been a Simons Visiting Professor at the International Center for Theoretical Sciences of the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, Bangalore. Professor Dasgupta is a fellow of the Indian Academy of Sciences, Bangalore, since 1992, the National Academy of Sciences, India, Allahabad, since 2000, and the World Academy of Sciences, TWAS, 2007. He is a recipient of the Warner Toysh Memorial Prize in 1974, Fellowship of the Alfred Pleasone Foundation, 1984 to 1987, 
and the DAE Raja Ramana Prize, 1999, the UGC Award entitled Sir C. V. Raman Award from 2010, in 2010, and the J.C. Bose National Fellowship from 2006 to 2019. And he is the Sub Distinguished Fellow from 2020 to present. Uh, Professor Das Gupta was elected to the Fellowship of the Indian National Science Academy in the year 2000. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Das Gupta, for a wonderful thank lecture. You. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, I guess this is the end of the session. Yes, yes. I think, uh, yes. <clears throat> thank you very much for giving such a uh, wonderful lecture and that we all enjoyed. Um, uh, and uh, Professor Kakar, thank you. And Gayati for reading the citation and the office staff of INSA, Brutati Chattopadha, for all their help. Thank you very much. We come to the end of this session. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. We'll stop sharing our live session. Thank you, sir.